Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, uh, where we will discuss uh, CLL, second line and subsequent treatments. Uh, we've got a great panel here today. Um, very much looking forward to this, discuss this discussion. Um, just for context for everybody, we did recently, uh, about a week ago, also do a um, webinar on first line treatments. So if you are expecting to discuss the sort of first treatments that are given for CLL, you may like to refer back to that webinar um, following this one. Um, we're purely going to discuss sort of relapsed and refractory CLL treatments today. A uh, bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, we won't be allowing um, participants to um, share their videos or ask questions verbally. Um, if you're on Zoom, please use the chat function, which you may find at the bottom or at the top of the screen, depending on which um, type of computer or, or phone or etc. you're on. Um, but let's look for the little speech bubble button and you should be able to ask your questions there. Um, if you're watching us on Facebook, thank you for joining us. Um, you can ask your questions uh, by popping them in the chat box and we have a colleague looking out for those and sending them, uh, sending them over to us on Zoom so we can answer those as well. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's do introductions. So my name is Charlotte, I'm the Patient Advocacy Manager here at Leukemia Care and I'll be co-chairing today's session with Stephen. Um, Stephen, would you mind introducing yourself for me? Yeah. Skokrov. I'm the Director of Operations and External Affairs at Lymphoma Action and this is another webinar in a series of them that we've done in conjunction with uh, Leukemia Care and we've got a lot more planned as well so uh, uh, look forward to that today. Great. Thank you Stephen and um, yeah hopefully we will continue these into, into the future for a while. They've been a great series so far. Um, maybe I'll come to Tal next if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself for me. Yes thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm Tal Munir, I'm a hematology consultant at a Leeds Teaching Hospital, so it's my pleasure to be talking to all of you guys. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And Leanne? Hi everyone, I'm Leanne Palmer, I'm a clinical nurse specialist at the Churchill Hospital in Oxford. Thank you. And um, Robin? Hello everybody, I'm Robin Edwards, I'm a CLL patient. Okay, thank you. And Nick? Hi everybody, uh, pleasure to join you all today as a treated CLL patient. Thanks Nick. Okay, so um, I think we might as well kick straight off with the presentation from Tal, if you wouldn't mind um, starting off the conversation for us. You're still on mute, um, just in case you're trying to speak. I can't see you at the moment. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about the delay. Sorry, I'm just working out technology here. Um, so I'm, I'm Tal Manir. I'm a hematology consultant at Leeds Teaching Hospital. Um, that's where I work. That's our oncology, um, dedicated oncology unit. Uh, that's the Glorious Yorkshire. And uh, uh, that's the University of Leeds. Um, uh, these are my disclosures, which I have to put forward. So I think um, the job I've been given is to cover CLL in relapse refractory setting. But I think I always put this slide in front so that um, all the medics and even the patients can realize um, what a change in CLL treatment has happened. Um, I think it's a very, very busy slide, but um, you can see that from the year 1978 onwards to 2020, 21 going on, we had very few drugs um, till 2010 and mostly the drugs were chemo chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Uh, which we can talk about. Um, they, they gave us um, our patients good remissions, but there was toxicity attached to these molecules. But since 2010, the last decade has just seen a plethora of drugs which have come along. And now we are starting to use these molecules or we have been using these molecules now for some time. And um, it's just a very busy number of um, uh, uh, drugs that we are able to use and many more are coming at this moment in time. 
just on the top that UK has been able to do multiple clinical trials with a lot of people uh, like yourselves, um, helping us to construct trials which are able to ask uh, very good questions. And it starts from the CLL1 study. And now, as we know that we ha have got FLARE study and it's being as amended and now we've got flare 2 study at the moment and there are next generation of studies which are coming as well and right at the bottom of the slide is actually um i wouldn't go into the detail of that but previously we just used to look at these cll cells but now we are able to do uh, whole genome sequencing next generation sequencing on our patients to actually optimize the therapy as well as understand cll better so i think the thing to appreciate on this slide from my perspective, and I always look at this slide and remind myself how the changes have happened and how far have we moved to the treatment of CLL. I think it's fair to say that there are two concepts uh, emerging in the management of CLL. And I think it's fair to say that is true for the frontline treatment as well as for patients who are relapsing. And I think the main thing to say is that the continuous and indefinite therapy is something like uh, treatment with ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, and patients will continue the treatment as long as they're responding to the therapy. And then the fixed duration therapy concept is primarily limited amount of treatment, um, like chemoimmunotherapy, which we used to give for six cycles and then we stop but like venetoclax with rituximab, which is given for 24 months and then everybody stops at that point. Uh, we can talk about it later on um, that there is fixed duration therapy, but then there is other concepts like MRD driven therapy, which is being explored in clinical trials at, pre at present moment. So I think when I'm choosing CLL therapy for my patient, whether in the frontline setting or in the relapsed refractory setting, I'm trying to answer four questions really, which are um, useful for me. And I think it is an important thing that the fitness is still comes into play. And I think it's more not about the age now because a lot of the molecules we can use in a spectrum of age group. I think it's more about the frailty in terms of the comorbidities that patients can have or, uh, or we can acquire over time. Um, and in that group, really, we are looking at the cardiovascular status, which is, means the heart um, really, and um, how that is cope, that's going to cope with the molecules that we can use. And that has become very important with the B cell receptor antagonists, such as um, um, just as, such as ibrutinib and acalabrutinib. And the renal function, the kidneys, whether they are able to tolerate treatments like venetoclax are, have become quite important. And I think the third thing that as, as a clinician I look at is the biology of the disease. And I look at the high risk markers in my patients, whether the CLL clone, which is, defines how well it is going to respond to various kinds of therapies, um, have, has become quite important in my opinion, um, which was not an important question before because we didn't have enough molecules to play with. But now as we are running into an era of um, treating patients with different drugs, we uh, have to look at the biology of the disease in much more detail. And a lot of clinical trials are now looking at questions such as, that if I use this combination in this group of patients, how well um, these patients are going to respond. So I think biology of the disease, and I've just put forward a few things like TP53 status, IGHV status, and I normally talk to my patients about it when I'm offering the choice. And I think the third thing, uh, the fourth thing, which is important uh, when I'm talking to patients is the maturity of the data. A lot of the trials have got a very short follow-up. So I think once we have to remember that the longer follow-up is important, especially in the frontline studies, as well as in the relapse studies, because the maturity of data tells us, um, you know, if the patients have been taking the drug for six years, 10 years, as compared to somebody taking the drug for just two years. And I think that is important as well. And lastly, the most important question is that what do you want really in terms of what is the goal of this treatment? Am I going to give you the treatment which is going to get you into very good remission um, at the cost of affecting your quality of life, at the cost of um, 
may be exposing you to increased risk of COVID. I think that is important to remember as well in this COVID era. So I think at the end of the day, uh, it comes down to a clinical decision, which we will take in collaboration with our patients, but we have to give all of those things in front of yourselves to make the choice in, in, uh, in, in treating uh, CLL in the relapsed refractory setting. So I'm just going to briefly brush through a few concepts which um, uh, the, uh, the, how the treatment is uh, evolving for relapsed refractory CLL. And rather than showing you um, the fancy curves, I just want to highlight the fact this is the data for um, using chemoimmunotherapy and primarily it's the treatment called bendamustin and rituximab. And I've, there are multiple studies where bendamustin and rituximab was used as the comparator arm. It was the standard arm because this was the treatment we used to use. And I've just put down as median PFS and highlighted on that. And what it is showing in all the studies that half of the patients will relapse nearly a year or year and a half when they have their chemoimmunotherapy. So the response is not long lasting in relapsed refractory setting. What I'm trying to say is that the chemoimmunotherapy days in relapsed refractory CLL are numbered. And all of these trials have shown the benefit of molecules like ibrutinib, like idolisib or venetoclax with rituximab as compared to chemoimmunotherapy. So I think the point of sharing the slide is that the chemoimmunotherapy is not the right treatment in the relapsed refractory setting in this era now. What about um, the new molecules? And this is uh, the long-term follow-up data of ibrutinib. Um, and ibrutinib, this is what we call as a Kaplan-Meier curve. And I think the important thing I would like to highlight to you is that if you look at the x-axis on this bar, the follow-up is going up to 72 months, which means it's a, it's a very, very long follow-up, six years follow-up on patients taking this single drug, ibrutinib. Um, and what we find is that half of the patients will relapse nearly four years into treatment with, with ibrutinib as single agent. The standard arm was ofatumumab, which didn't do very well, which we expected at that point, but that was the standard treatment at that point. At the same time, the other drug which found its way was the idolisib, which is the PI3 kinase inhibitor. Slight works differently to ibrutinib, um, and it was better than rituximab. Um, but now you can see the difference in the curves now. You're looking at only 24 months follow-up time as compared to ibrutinib follow-up time. And there is a clear difference there that half of the patients on idolisib would need another therapy nearly one and a half years into treatment with that, with that drug. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that when we present this data to you, I think the long-term longevity of the data is important as well as giving you the figures are important. So when I talk to my patients, I'd say to them, you know, I would expect half of the patients to be relapsing nearly four years into ibrutinib therapy. And with idelisib, I would say, you know, one and a half years. But then I will also say that um, it is like, it can be likely that you will have a longer response to it, but that is what the data shows on the phase three study. Um, and then we've got the other new molecule that we've got is the second generation BTK inhibitor called acalibrutinib. So this is the data from the study called ASCEND study. And this was the first study which was comparing uh, a BTK inhibitor, acalibrutinib, versus idolisib rituximab or bendamustine rituximab. So we had chemoimmunotherapy as well as we have the uh, PI3 kinase inhibitor there. And the curve says, all I can show you is that the blue curve is the acalibrutinib one and the orange one is the other two arms. And if it is going down, it means that people are relapsing in this, in this arm and clearly the BTK inhibitor acalibrutinib was better as compared to these two arms. Based on this data, the drug has been approved and actually we can use it in UK now um, as, as patients who had one uh, previous one line of therapy. Again, I would say, I just highlight the point that the follow-up is only 28 months. So very short follow-up as compared to what you see with, with the other, um, with ibrutinib. And then 
that takes me to the next um, big drug, which we have got in CLL is venetoclax, and that is combined with rituximab. This is the data now, five-year follow-up data on uh, this combination, which is used for two years, and then everybody stops at two years of venetoclax therapy. And that was compared to bendamustine rituximab. So the bendamustine rituximab patients, half of the patients relapsed at 17 months. And now at five years follow-up, the venetoclax rituximab data says that half of the patients are relapsing at four and a half years um, of uh, this fixed duration therapy, which is a quite exceptional result in the relapsed refractory sim setting, similar to what we saw with ibrutinib data. So I think that takes me to the next slide, which is that second line options in CLL are include the B cell receptor antagonist, which is the ibrutinib, idelirisib, and acalabrutinib. And um, venetoclax rituximab. And really, I have taken chemoimmunotherapy out of the equation. Um, and I think I'm not, I've not used chemoimmunotherapy in this setting now for nearly three or four years. Um, I think the, either the patients get venetoclax rituximab or ibrutinib or idelisib, uh, that would be the second line therapy. And the third line therapy would be dependent on the second line therapy and you can switch over. So it's kind of a switch over between the two. And then you can, we can treat our patients later on with venetoclax monotherapy if the patients have not relapsed on venetoclax rituximab. So I think what I'm trying to say is that we've got two classes of drugs which would be using, uh, we would be using in relapsed refractory setting, but the uh, B cell receptor antagonist there are multiple drugs in that which are, we are able to use in this setting. I think the next slide, I just want to highlight the red bar really. I think all what I'm trying to say here is that all of the trials that were done here, um, these were done in the relapsed refractory setting. And all of these molecules which got the license had very few number of patients who had um, previous novel agents. So for example, in um, Resonate study, in Ibru with ibrutinib treated patients, none of the patients have had previous BTK venetoclax or p 3 kinase inhibitor, which is understandable because this was the first study to prove the concept. But even in the venetoclax studies, there were no, not many patients at all. So that leads us to a problem that the sequencing in relapsed refractory CLL has become an issue. Um, now we know that we can use these molecules in frontline setting. So I think the main question really is whether we use a BTK inhibitor, which is ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, versus venetoclax with or without rituximab. And the last option is pi 3 kinase inhibitor, which is idelisib with rituximab. So I think those are the three main thing. And I think what to choose from these options is the question that is most frequently asked by the medical community as well as uh, patients as well. So I will try to just give you a brief idea where I stand on this, that between BTK inhibitor and PI3 kinase inhibitors, so I'm talking about ibrutinib or acalabrutinib versus idelisib, it's a clear, there's a clear winner there. Um, it, this is the data, real world data, and I showed you the send data as well. Both are suggesting that actually the um, BTK inhibitors are better as compared to PI3 kinase inhibitor. So I don't think there is a kind of an argument about that. And I think we should be using a BTKI in this setting. There is some data now actually on patients who are intolerant to ibrutinib. So some patients do get a toxicity from ibrutinib, which could be in terms of joint pains, could be sometimes um, atrial fibrillation, you know, a lot of other side effects. And there is data that actually, if you roll them over to a second generation BTK inhibitor like acalabrutinib, that results in good duration of response. So you can see that this curve up here, it's not going down flat downwards. It's, it's kind of managed quite nicely over a reasonable period of time. And it looks like that if you be swap that um, BTK inhibitor, the patients are going to benefit from it. So it's important to recognize that. And we can actually put our patients in UK who are intolerant to ibrutinib onto um, 
ACAL routes and, and uh, NHS does allow us to do that. What about venetoplax? If you have had ibrutinib or idlisib in the past, whether venetoplax will work for you. And there is good data on that. This is a good phase two study looking at venetoplax single agent ibrutinib and idlisib. And it was, there were two studies, both of them showed that actually the response is in excess of two years. And it is one of the good choices that we have got in this relapse refractory setting. So the argument I'm making is that if we use ibrutinib or idlisib or acalibrutinib and then use venetoclax, that is a very decent option. There is some data actually on now whether we can use venetoclax again. So if somebody has had venetoclax before, say two years of venetoclax rituximab, and then didn't um, uh, progress on the treatment and most probably had a response for one to three years, then essentially retreatment with venetoclax, whether that was possible. And it was looked at this study, which is a small study, but 13 out of 18 patients responded to venetoclax in this setting. And there were patients on Murano study who actually were, were retreated and three out of four patients responded again. So it is, looks like one of those drugs where you can have a block of treatment for two years. And then if you had a decent response, you can have another shot at venetoclax again. What about using the other way around? So say, for example, you use venetoclax first, and then you go to BTKI inhibitor. And what, what is the response in that? And the response actually is pretty good. That is very clear. But in patients who've had previous BTKI inhibitor and they were not responding to it or they were becoming resistant to it, the response was very poor in those patients. And this was clarified in all of these studies now. So we have got decent amount of uh, real world data, whether we can use ibrutinib or acalibrutinib after venetoclax. So that's my conclusion that it is an effective treatment, but if you are resistant to BTKI inhibitor before, then that results in poor responses. Don't worry about this one. I won't go into the detail of that, but this is why I presented at BSH to the clinical community, just the brief outline of how I see uh, the treatment of uh, CLL progressing in different scenarios um, and using which molecule at different time points. So don't get worried about it. I won't go into the detail of this at all. Lastly, Nick asked me to just present some promising drugs and data, what is out there. So the, this is a new molecule called LOXA305. Um, We've got the study running in Leeds at the moment. This is a study with a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. So it works in a different way to uh, ibrutinib or acalibrutinib. So ibrutinib or acalibrutinib binds to a very specific amino acid in the BTK pocket. Um, whereas LOXO is different, that it is binding to different sites. So a lot of these patients on this study, around 170 patients, have had a BTK inhibitor in the past and essentially had, a lot of them had uh, venetoclax as well. And what we found was that they had mutations in this study um, and the data shows that these patients are responding to these molecules. And now the data was public, well uh, presented at ASH last year and that's more than a year response to this kind of therapy, which is very exciting actually, because this is one of the new class of drugs, which uh, is a BTK inhibitor, where we would, should be able to use it in our patients in future. There is a similar drug called ARC-531. It's, it's it is lagging a bit behind, but it is working as well. And it is coming into clinical trials at this moment in time um, in phase two and phase three trials. What about combinations? There are, I can you know make slides on that, but there are loads of combinations. People are using VTK inhibitor in combination with venetoclax, in combination with obinutizumab. There are new generation, second uh, generation antibodies. There are triplets, which means using a BTK inhibitor, venetoclax, and obinutizumab in relapsed refractory CLL. All of these things are being used, are being looked at in clinical trials. We obviously presented our clarity and ICICL data and contributed to that um, as well. But what I would say with combinations at the moment is that this is early data at the moment, whether these will become a standard therapy for our patients 
we still need to wait for the follow-up data and large larger phase um, studies at, which are not there at this moment in time. One question that always comes back to us, whether we can still transplant some patients who are relapsing on these molecules. And there is some data now of uh, doing an allergenic stem cell transplant. And the data looks good in terms of that a two year survival looks reasonably good. And uh, no matter whether patients have had ibrutinib acalabrutinib or venetoclax, these patients were able to have the transplant. With transplantation in CLL, you know, average age of a transplant patient is normally um, around 60 years. That some centers will do up to the age of 65, 70. But primarily the reason is that patients who've had a lot of comorbidities or they don't have a uh, matched donor they do, don't do very well with the transplant and have complications related to that. So it's a small group of patients where we can still look at this option uh, of transplantations. Uh, what about CAR T cells? And that's one of the questions. This is the data presented at ASH last year as well. Very small number of patients. Um, and what I can say on this data is that the response rate has been good, um, but it is a very highly selected group of patients and if you add ibrutinib with the CAR T cells, that appears to make a difference. These trials might be coming as well um, to UK as well. And I'm hoping that we might be able to offer these to some of our patients. But at the moment, this is a very small group of patients who are having it. Um, and the reason for that is that toxicity related to the CAR T cells, um, there, it is a very laborious process. Um, half of the patients need to go to intensive care unit for one reason or another. But there are other types of cells called NK cells. And these cells are basically taken from the cords um, when the baby is born. And these NK cells are purified and, and they are delivered to the patients and they can fight against the CLL. And that's how that CAR NK cell therapy happens. This is being looked at. Um, this could be an off the shelf product where you have got NK cells prepared and you can give it to your patients. And actually there was some encouraging data coming from a very specialized centers that it might be becoming an option for in future. So I will just conclude at this time. I think the novel agents are now being incorporated into the frontline treatment algorithms, um, but we are using it in relapsed refractory CLL to good success. The reversible non-covalent BTK inhibitor, I think are an important step forward in the treatment of relapsed refractory CLL. And I'm particularly talking about the LOXO uh, compound. The combinations are very exciting, but one of the problems is that when we get this kind of drugs, everything moves to the frontline setting as people want to use the best therapy in the frontline space. But hopefully we will get some more data on that. And I think the last thing, the cellular therapy I just have to provide a word of caution. It's a limited option, but the safer cells might be coming in the future to offer hope. And I will stop there. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, you managed to cover so much in such a short period of time. Thank you for that. Um, I just think I can't stop thinking about the the web diagram. I've seen that presented in many places before, and I can imagine it only gets more and more complicated um, as time goes on. Um, I was thinking how I could perhaps summarise your presentation. I guess it sounds like things are becoming more complicated, and you're, you said there that most sequences are are good, but you're still trying to work out what the best combinations are. Is that a sort of a fair summary? Um. Yes, I think, I think that's a very fair summary. I think the things have become more complicated because we have we can use all of these novel agents in the frontline setting now as well. And what you use in the frontline setting has an impact on the relapsed refractory setting. Whereas previously it was, you know, you know it's, um, we, we used to use chemoimmunotherapy, then the second line option was chemo, maybe further chemoimmunotherapy, and then everybody gets a BTK inhibitor and then everybody gets venetoclax. Things have become a bit more complicated now because we've got venetoclax option up front, we've got a brutinib and a calabrutinib option up front. And then depending on how we play it, I think 
defines how we were going to treat the relapsed refractory patients. But I think that is a good problem to have for clinicians. And I think we have choices there, which is the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we'll bring in the rest of our panel now. I wondered whether I could come to our patients first, or on a very similar point to what I was discussing there, maybe Nick first. Um, obviously, what Tal has described is completely complicated and a bit crazy. How was that for you when you got to second line in terms of you know, making that decision and understanding this complex web? Um, I'm feeding back a little bit. Is that okay? Um, yeah, first line treatment for me was a different kettle of fish um, making the decision to second line treatment. First line treatment, um, I almost felt I was missing the boat knowing that all of these treatments were coming and the only option available was flare, rolled my dice, had my treatment and accepted what I had, you know, uh, moving forward. And that didn't work as well as I wanted. So um, I had to stop that treatment fairly early um, because it impacted really negatively on, on me and my bone marrow. And um, I was told I'd have a fairly short remission and, you know, I got a reasonable remission for a couple of years. And then I was watching treatment come again. And uh, yeah, in all honesty, making that decision wasn't an easy one. You know, I, I wanted the opportunity to maybe catch up with what I didn't get the first time round, which was a treatment holiday and get venetoclax plus rituximab, but I had weak bone marrow. So I'm telling a bit about my clinical background, you know, my own personal. Background. So I couldn't tolerate that. And then I had an option then the calibrutinib was just available on a clinical trial, but the clinical trial involved a lot of extra scanning and a lot of extra monitoring. And I had a lifestyle where I wanted the particular, uh, you know, option so I could function a little bit better in the community. So I brutinib then became my option and I really did struggle with a decision. So in, in the only way I was able to make that decision was I'm fairly well informed already. I think I'd already done too much research on that and that didn't help me. So you need to do enough research, but not enough, but talk to your doctor. Ironically, after all of this, I, my doctor said, just do a pros and cons list and send it to me and I'll review it. And that's what he did. And he said, it's an excellent review. And he sent me a little message at the back there saying, you seem to have selected ibrutinib. You never know, it might just do the trick. And those little words from my doctor at the end who I had confidence with saying, you never know, this might just do the trick, is where I am today, still on ibrutinib two years later. Thanks, Nick. I think it's interesting you say you felt you were well informed and obviously you are for those that know you, but you still found it a difficult decision. I think that's an interesting perspective. Absolutely. Um, if anything, it, it made, me, made it a little bit worse to some degree because <laughs> you overthink, um, but... You know, now there are even more treatment options. And, and obviously, as Tal pointed out, um, you know, patients are being treated differently in the front line. So the whole thing is, is, but it is what it is, the disease. And you can only be treated with what's available at the time. And, yeah. and, and you know, um, after what Tal said, I think the future is looking extremely rosy. I mean, it's it's great listening to these talks because... You know, one thing you do realise when you come to second line treatments, I'm still answering your question, is you have fewer options available. You know, we've, we've never had a lot of options in the second line. Well, what Tails just showed us is there are many more options. And with the non-covalent BTKI, uh, you know, there are all these options. So it, it's really positive. Yep, I agree. Robin, how about you? How was this choice that Nick has described for you? <laughs> well... I've lost your sound, Robin. I don't know if anybody else has. Yeah, I'm getting some nods. Sorry. Can you hear me now? We can, yes, carry on. Sorry, I went on the off button. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> no so, um, so uh, I'm not sure we get, so uh, for me, I think the choice was easier than Nick, um, primarily because I had ideas in my mind. I got cast 
ideas about what I wanted and didn't want to do. So um, I was treated in 2012 with SCR and um, <clears throat> and uh, as some of you heard before, that was within weeks of me being diagnosed, which is very unusual. Um, and that gave me around about three and a half years of um, being in a good place uh, uh, until I, uh, we could see that my blood numbers were going out of line. And I'd already done some reading up and my background was in technology and, uh, and doing uh, uh, tests of new technology. So you could see immediately my thinking was, um, I would quite like to try something new because I didn't really want to go back down the FCR route and it seemed to be the best thing at the time that was generally available. So um, the discussion I had with my doctor was, I've thought about this and I'd like to do a trial, please. And the answer was, you need to think about all of this. Uh, uh, and so we had a series of discussions. We looked at various options. And in fact, as a result of that, um, I uh, was lucky enough to get accepted on the Clarity trial, which I think Tal showed on a chart earlier. <laughs> so um, it, I wanted to do something new. I trusted technology in my reading. And also, in fact, I took the documentation from uh, the trials that were available and I reviewed them with somebody I knew that actually um, had a science background uh, and then we did a, a, a pros and cons of what the options were including doing nothing which was not a good answer so that's a pretty good summary. Great thank you seems like pros and cons list is the way to move forward as a tip for today. Uh, Leanne I wanted to come to you next if I may. Um, it sounds as if um, you know Nick and Robin had a lot of involvement in their decision making here. Is that really important to you as clinic cl uh, clinically supporting patients through the decision? And how do you manage their expectations given some of the restrictions around the options and things like that? So I think the patient being involved in the discussions is the key thing. I think uh, there's not going to be one right answer for everybody. I think it's down to their own individual um, lifestyle. Some people might naturally um, feel that they lean more towards one treatment than another. I think Nick somebody took quite well with clinical trials. Some, for some people, going on a clinical trial is the right thing, and they can get options. Sometimes they can have treatment options available that they would not normally get, but there is restrictions with the number of visits and the extra tests that are required. And for some people, that would be a definite positive. And for other people, that would be a negative. I think um, discussing how practically the treatments impact on people's day-to-day -day living is also key. So, um, for example, with venetoclax, um, although, yes, it's a type of treatment you have to come up to if it's given in the outpatient setting, the day unit, and there's quite a lot of blood test monitoring with that, which, you know, would work brilliant for some people, but not for others. So I think the biggest key, really, is the pros and cons list, but also letting people know what the delivery of those drugs is, how they'll be receiving them, and then what the side effect profile is. And um, is it a little bit harder to have those conversations with uh, sort of second line or further line treatments because of an experience they've already had before? They may already have sort of some preconceived notions or they might be a bit disappointed that they have relapsed. Is it, is it a more difficult conversation? Um, it can go either way, to be honest. In some, in some ways, when people have already had first-line treatment, you've got something you can compare it to. You can say, like, when you had treat this treatment, this part will be similar, this part will be different. If they had treatment on, on our day treatment unit, they already know the team there and they know the staff there. Um, and in other ways, you know, it can be like, you know, starting again because it's completely different treatment and it's still the emotional impact of relapsing and, and needing treatment again. So we always, I always just take it, you know, back to the beginning really and go through it as if they've never heard the information before because not everybody, not everybody has and each regime delivery is different. Great, thank you for that. It's really helpful. And one last question to Tal before I pass them to Stephen to go through some of the questions that I know we've had in the chat box already. But Tal, may I um, just ask, um, 
about testing before treatment. Um, so I think to be fair, most people will be knowledgeable about the sort of tests that are required before treatment, given they've already gone through one set. But is it different for a second line or is it a case of repeating the same tests? What, what do you do the, sort of at the relapse point to investigate? I think the good the good thing now is um, uh, the the molecules most of the molecules will mo work for uh, all types of CLL now. Uh, so previously we had an issue that uh, chemoimmunotherapy uh, was given to patients who've had TP53 abnormality. That's not the case now. Um, but in the, in the relapsed refractory setting, and normally, or even in the frontline setting, I do talk to patients about. This is what I can get you on NHS treatment, and this is what I can get you on um, the clinical trials. Because um, we have got a quite active clinical trials unit, I always offer that to my patients. And you know, people like Robin have been fantastic for us to accumulate that data. Um, I think the testing is still important, and simply because we will, like I showed you in my slides, that one of the things I'm looking for is you know, if somebody has got TP53 abnormality, um, maybe I would be thinking about continuous therapy or might be offering them a clinical trial where I feel that actually this treatment option might be much better for my patient in long-term uh, outcome. Um, and I think those are the questions that still are unanswered at the moment if one treatment like venetoclax-based therapy versus the ibrutinib or acalabrutinib is better in that setting because those trials are not, not happening and not going to happen. Great, thank you for that. Um, Stephen, over to you. Thanks, yes. Um, so a couple of questions that are coming. Before I go into that, we've obviously had some questions in advance as well. And I was particularly, uh, Tal, you mentioned about how you kind of use age, comorbidities, disease biology, about how to try to kind of uh, identify the right treatment or choosing a treatment, but actually one of the outputs of that is kind of quality of life. And I was really going to focus a bit more on side effects because obviously you don't know in advance what those side effects might be. You might have a side effects profile, but actually until you start giving the treatment. So how do you kind of address side effects that people might be having when they're going through treatment? How does that um, impact kind of treatment choices as well? And actually we know that some people might kind of not report side effects because for fear of being taken off the treatment, but there are things that you can do that it's not as extreme as that just because people have got side effects. So how do you approach that with a patient when you're kind of looking at these second line treatments? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question because I think at the end of the day, the goal of the treatment for CLL is divided into, you know, are we going to go towards a very deep remission or, you know, talking about eventual, you know, long disease free interval uh, with the fixed duration therapy, or are we happy to just continue with continuous therapy and essentially accepting the fact that this treatment might be as good as fixed duration therapy, but might have cumulative side effects over time. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think a lot of the discussion about the choice of therapy is based on the quality of life. And in COVID, that was a simple, straightforward, you know, answer because um, we don't want our patients to be coming to the hospital that frequently. And, you know, at that point, acalabrutinib, we were able to use it in expanded access program. And a lot of our patients who actually needed the therapy during the height of the COVID pandemic we were able to use those molecules at that point and eliminate, not eliminating, but reducing the risk of infections and those kind of things. Um, but I think when I see the patient now, I talk about, you know, with the venetically expressed therapy, you will have to take the pain for the first two or three months, but then you will see the gain after a year. Um, with the abrutinib or acalabrutinib, you will have to play the long game here and you will accumulate toxicity over time. And that is something that I would need to monitor you for that. So in some patients where I'm worried about their health status, I'm now doing heart scans, echocardiogram before they start the treatment. Um, I check their kidney functions quite thoroughly and want to make sure that I've covered that properly before they start the therapy. So 
a lot of treatment choices are based on the toxicity that I might see in future with those molecules. Mm. Um, and Robin, was that was side effects? Can that play any part in your experience or your treatment choices? So uh, interesting, Stephen. Uh, uh, I didn't specify, I don't think, but Clarity was a brutinib and venetoclax. Uh, and I would say the only thing that I could identify that seemed to be on the list of side effects was I had some splitting of my nails, which I think is an abrutinib uh, side effect rather than anything else. And to be honest, it was fairly trivial, but it was clearly different to what I was used to. Other than that, um, uh, Atal mentioned you know, venetoclax and the first two months. Uh, in fact, I found it quite reassuring that I was being checked very regularly with venetoclax. Uh, so, um, no, I would say all in all, very positive and few side effects. <laughs> That's good. Um, no, thanks for that. So kind of moving on to one of the questions we've had, it, and perhaps this to Leanne. So we haven't particularly mentioned uh, active monitoring or watch and wait as part of the kind of treatment portfolio. We have actually had another earlier webinar where we specifically talked about active monitoring both for first line and also for subsequent as well but we've had a particular question around that about what is the rationale for continuing on watch and wait in this example with SLL when that's relaxed um, we do know that some people start off active monitoring before they're treated but some people have some treatment and then they go on active monitoring for a period of time perhaps before being treated again. But Leanne, perhaps you could explain what that rationale might be or what people can understand for that, if that's okay. Yep, that's fine. So um, sometimes I think it's very clear when to restart treatment again or give treatment in the first place. Um, sometimes it's not always quite clear. So I guess what we don't want to do is expose people to the toxicities or the side effects of treatment any earlier than what we need to. So sometimes we can see from blood tests that the CLL is starting um, to relapse again, but it's not at the point where it's causing any problems, for example, with the haemoglobin or it's not causing any problems with the platelets. And I think I always say to my patient that the blood results are really important and they are, but so is how is a patient's feeling. So I think the two things go hand in hand. So we're always assessing for the B symptoms, so the night sweats, weight loss, reduced appetite, um, how are the energy levels, any repeated infections, how the lymph nodes are doing. And I think I think it's looking at the whole picture all together. Um, and then deciding with the patient when the right time to then start treatment is. Okay, thanks. Um, just going back to one of the early questions. So this was very specifically about um, the FLARE trial and then the possibility of joining the static trial when it opens later in the year. Um, could you perhaps start this with, with Tal, comment on the possibility that it might be important for patients treated with albutinib to not to continue to use it daily without having a break. Um, and therefore, what does that mean for this particular person who's been on the FLARE trial for a while and then possibly would be able to join the static trial or not later in the year? Yeah, so on the FLARE study, I can answer that it uh, was designed to look at um, a, people taking albutinib for six years and then we were going to stop therapy at that point. When we designed the trial initially, um, abrutinib was in its infancy. We didn't know how long people will need to take abrutinib for, um, but we've got a lot more data now at this moment in time. What I can say is that people in the frontline setting who've been taking abrutinib for a long time, and six years is a long time, um, if you stop abrutinib, disease doesn't relapse very quickly at all. And there's a study out looking at uh, patients relapsing at one and a half to two years after stopping ibrutinib in that setting, setting, suggesting that with prolonged therapy comes deeper remission. Um, static, so in, in terms of flare, the trial is clear, six years of therapy, and then you stop at that point. But then the static study is going to look at the other question, which is quite a, an interesting question. Um, and half of the people on that study will um, go and get more ibrutinib right from the beginning, but the other half will just be monitored. And those are the people who 
are what I've said before is that when they stop therapy, if they start to relapse, then we will reintroduce ibrutinib in those patients. So people are not going to lose out with that approach. And that will give us a good um, idea where the stop and start is possible with BCRI therapy and maybe the right thing to do. Uh, there is some data from prostate cancer studies that if we use androgen-based therapies and if you use it continuously, it becomes ineffective. But if you have stops and starts, what happens is that tumor sees the drug, goes into remission, gives give some time off, then it starts to come back again and then you re, re uh, treat at that point, and then it works absolutely fine. So um, I think there is some good science behind the static study, and uh, I would reiterate the point to stop at six years, but then look forward to static study, which will be opening in nearly all the centers that were open for FLARE study as well. Thank you for that. And again, another quite specific one about perhaps uh, for trials. Um, so this is about the risk of Richter's transformation. And um, is there any ongoing study or trials about the risk of Richter's transformation and, and what particular treatments, perhaps even in the example of ibrutinib, does that have an increased risk? Do we know that now? And if not, how do we kind of get to know more information about that? I think unfortunately that's one of the most difficult part of CLL is Richter's transformation because we still haven't been able to crack it properly. What I can say at um, the moment is that majority of the Richter's transformations happen in patients with very complex genotype. Although I know the question did mention that there were no deletions detected, but um, now we do the molecular marking in most of our patients and we are finding other mutations in different parts of the genes like Berg3 mutation, like um, Notch1 mutation. There is good evidence that patients with you know, Berg3 and um, some, some patients with SF3B1 mutations, they are at a higher risk of getting uh, these complications. So we're learning at the moment. As, as far as the data suggests with ibrutinib and increased risk of rictus, there's there is not much data to suggest that actually ibrutinib does increase the risk of rictus. Actually, the highest number of rictus in any study were venetoclax-based therapy. Um, but again, these were the patients who've had many lines of therapies before, and they were uh, treated with a lot of treatments in the past, which increased the genomic complex complexity leading to that problem. Um, so I, I'm afraid I don't have a complete answer there, really, to be honest, but simply because we don't understand Richter's completely. There are trials going on at the moment to treat Richter's, and there are things that we are doing at the moment to see how we can best manage the disease. Perhaps you could just explain what Richter's transformation is for those of you who don't okay. know what it is. So yeah. Richter's you. transformation is, is development of a clone to what we call as high-grade lymphoma, on the background of CLL. So say if somebody had CLL for some time and then this clone arises, which can arise separately to, from CLL clone or can arise from the CLL clone and gives rise to what we call as diffuse large B cell lymphoma or Hodgkin's disease. And um, it is one of the feared complications, which is um, rare, but does happen. Thank you. I think again, going back to the diagram that you showed earlier that Charlotte mentioned as well. It, it does um, you know, information and, and people becoming as expert as they can be in understanding their own disease and what, their, what the different options are is, 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 is a real challenge. And, and it, it, you know, organizations like ourselves and Lymphoma Action and Leukemia Care aim to try to kind of keep ahead of this, to put the information in ways that are accessible to people. But um, people, you know, to, to become experts in their own experiences and, and, uh, it's, uh, and, and webinars like this help to kind of in, ensure that that continues to happen. Um, and again, just on going back to kind of some of the side effects that we touched on, had a couple of questions around specific things. So again, is there anything that people can do, particularly in this example where kidney health is, is, is a, a key thing to kind of be watching um, to keep their kidneys protective while on different types of treatments? Are there either, do you provide other kind of drugs or support to manage side effects or to help protect some of those potential comorbidities or what can people do 
um, themselves? Um, I think in, in my opinion, you know, you whatever treatment you need for your health, that is absolutely fine. Um, I think what um, happens is, um, you know, you can overdo things and you should not under treat other problems. So like somebody has got high blood pressure and they are on the best treatment for that, they should stay on that. I think what happens is that when they start the therapy, we as clinicians and Leanne, we will, you know, our pharmacist will go through all the medications and then we will look at which drugs interact with the molecule that we're going to put this patient on and then try to ascertain whether these are feasible with each other. So in, in terms of the protection, I think these, the drugs which are being given to you by the GPs and, you know, whatever reason you need to have it, that is absolutely fine. Whenever you need treatment, then that's the point where we would need to make a decision whether these drugs are suitable for you or not, and we can make changes as appropriate. And then uh, another one around uh, being on ibrutinib and having ailments related to sarcoidosis. Um, is that to be expected? Is that normal? Uh, perhaps I explain think, what sarcoidosis is as well for, for others. So sarcoid is a problem. Um, it's an immune autoimmune condition where um, essentially uh, people can get a variety of symptoms. There are some lung issues. The lymph nodes can build up in the lungs as well. And some people get skin rash, joint pains, and, and it's a multi, could be a multi-system disease. But some people with sarcoid don't need any treatment at all. Some just need topical steroids. Some people need steroids for a um, relatively good amount of time. And some people have really, really bad sarcoid. So it's a, like CLL, it's a spectrum of disease, really, to be honest. So I think it's a very difficult question to answer. I, I, I've seen the question and the, uh, uh, what, what I can say is that it's, uh, I, as far as I know, ibrutinib won't, won't cause any problems as such in terms of the sarcoid. But I think if there's a specific question, say for example, joint aches, then that ibrutinib can cause joint pains. Uh, that is a known side effect of that. Whether that's related to sarcoid, I, I don't know is the honest answer. And I think it's a very specific question, so it's difficult for me to answer that completely. I appreciate that. Thanks very much. I'm going to hand back to Charlotte. There's a good load of questions that have been sent through there on the chat. We've got a couple of others that uh, have been sent through in advance, so we push on with those and uh, um, over to Charlotte. Yes, and I apologise if anyone can hear the loud rain and the thunder in the background. I will talk as loudly as I can. The door is from work, of working from home. Um, Yes, I think we'll move on to preparing for treatment um, now, if we may. Leanne, maybe I could come to you first, and if you could just say a bit about what advice you give patients in terms of prepping for second or third or fourth treatment, given they perhaps already have expectations. Yeah, so I'd say um, write down any questions ahead of clinic appointments, because I think it's very easy when you go into the appointment and forget what you want to say, and particularly as conversation goes ahead. Um, obviously, I know COVID complicates things, but um, generally speaking, I would normally say if somebody could come along with you, um, just as it's another pair of ears listening to the information and helping you to remember what's being said. Um, obviously, I know we're in a COVID era, so things are slightly different at the moment. And I think just being very open with the doctor on um, what your lifestyle is, what you think works for you. Any, like, Don't be worried about asking any particular questions. And I think having good communication with the doctor, but also the clinical nurse specialist as well. So is that because often I think when you've had a clinic appointment, you can go away and you can think of all the other questions that you want to ask or you can't quite remember what was said and why. So I think having good links with the clinical nurse specialist is that you've got somebody to talk to and somebody to call outside of those clinic appointments to run through any additional questions. I always say I think communication is the biggest key with you know all members of the team, but just knowing who to go to to direct those questions to in between appointments and for when treatment started as well so as you can timely re be reporting side effects and feel comfortable raising concerns. Great thank you and maybe um, Robin I don't know if you have anything to add there to what Leanne said anything that you did specifically when you pre were preparing for your second treatment? So I did some background reading as I, I think I said anyway um, but you 
you do it cautiously with trusted um, resources. Uh, and the other thing I would say that I did slightly different, uh, by the way, I totally agree with what Leanne said on the whole, but the one thing I did slightly different was rather than calling, I got email contact. So I could ask a question at my convenience and now we get answered at the clinical nurses convenience because you know it, it, the things didn't need immediate response and I knew they were busy so I just made that little bit of sort of a, an unhook there just to give some flexibility but other than that I agree with Leanne. Great thank you I think um, that there's an interesting point when you say about um, timings and not needing it urgently I think that's one thing about CLL that you do often have not always but often is, is a little bit of time to consider so I think that's an important point Nick anything you wanted to add to preparing for treatment yeah I, I suppose I kind of followed some of the protocols I did for my first line treatment was just make sure I've got a lot of ducks in the row um, if I needed the dentist get up to date with my dentist get all of my other medicines um, sorted and stocked up my home to make sure that um, I had what I need. I let friends and family know, you know, <clears throat> like every treatment, you know, you don't know how you're going to react to the to the medications. So I made a point in the beginning of taking the prophylaxis, um, you know, on my brutinib. Some people react. I had reactions for the first few days and I stopped taking them because I didn't need them. Um, so, yeah, I spoke to um, you know, I agreed very much with everything that Leanne said. And again, with Robin, I managed to strike up probably as we're second treated, we've got a bit more of a connection with our healthcare team. So it's easier to connect by internet and other, we're all connected here by internet. So that was a very uh, handy way. And uh, yeah, just, just kept communication lines open. Um, and, and, and yeah, <laughs> nothing more right. to add really. Everybody's covered it. Thanks, Nick. That's really helpful. And I think if anybody is lacking those communication mechanisms, if you're not sure who you should speak to, get in touch with either us or Lymphoma Action and we will, you know, give some advice as to who to go to. But that's that's what we're here for as well, to help you navigate these, um, the, the NHS system and things like that. So, yeah, do do let us know if you need support. Um, I've noticed a couple more questions in, in the chat box, so I think I might go back to those now, and most of them are for you, Tal, unfortunately, um, or fortunately, uh, however you want, we want to look at it. Um, to go back to Richter's transformation, if we may, someone's asked if there's been any specific advances in that area in terms of treatment at all. So I think the answer to that question is, unfortunately, um, Richter's is one of the still a very difficult disease to treat, but there are uh, multiple trials which are looking at combination of um, chemoimmunotherapy. So our CHOP is the treatment that's given. Uh, our Oxford colleagues, NSU and Toby did a trial using ofatumumab and unfortunately it didn't give us uh, the positive results. But now there is another trial called STELLA trial, which is looking at addition of acalabrutinib to RCHOP for um, uh, Richter's patients. But then there are other, other people doing trials using combinations of venetoclax, PI3 kinase inhibitors, and chemoimmunotherapy all together to get patients into deeper remission. Unfortunately, the only thing that works for this disease is an allogenic stem cell transplant, which gives the long-term remission and that's where we are at the moment. Uh, the LOXO 305 actually has got a Richter's cohort and the initial data, uh, will be very small numbers, suggest a good response. Um, but I think with Richter's, the problem is that you see very good responses very, very quickly, but longevity of the response is the issue with, with this disease. So, um, and I know that the next steps that are coming are actually utilizing CAR T cells in this space. So one of the things that if, if the patient, any patient has got, you know, unfortunately do develop Richter's and they don't respond to the standard treatment, then CAR T cells could be looked at by NHS funded uh, treatment for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And that is a cohort um, that I know for a fact that people have been treated on NHS funded drug uh, NHS funded CAR T cells. 
Um, we don't have enough data on that, but that is being accumulated over time. Interesting you mentioned Carti. Someone um, has asked again, sort of a bit uh, for a bit of clarification, I guess, on in where you see Carti going, um, whether it will always remain sort of later on, or whether you see it moving further up the treatment pathway, which I appreciate is a tricky question, I know. Well, I think you say that, but I know that uh, the, the company, which is, I showed you very briefly the data of this compound, the CAR T cell uh, construct called lysocell. And essentially um, that is showing us, um, they are going to do a phase three study and actually comparing the lysocell versus venetoclax rituximab. So actually they are bringing it forward and they must be very confident about that, that they are able to do that. So it's, it's I think, my understanding is that it is being launched in US and then it's going to be rolled out into multiple um, in Europe and hopefully can come to UK as well. So I think it is coming forward. The NK cell therapy is very primitive. I think that is the hope for the future. If we can safely give it to our patients, then that would be fantastic. Great, thank you. And a final question on this topic. I know we uh, spoke a, a while ago about static and stopping and starting ibrutinib and um, that sparked a question around whether that's something you do exclusively in clinical trials or whether this person who's asking is on a calibrutinib. Is that something that is purely for research purposes at the present time? It's, it is a purely a trial question at the moment. The concept, the scientific question, the scientific rational is quite sound. And I think it is being looked at in our study, which is um, important to question to answer. And we might be doing that in the next three to four years time if the study is showing us that the outcomes for stopping therapy and then restarting is the same as continuous therapy, then we might be doing that. But at the moment, it is a scientific hypothesis which has not been proven. So I wouldn't advise anybody to do that on another clinical trial. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Stephen, I guess, I'll pass back to you now. Thanks. Um, a question that kind of keeps coming up, obviously there's lots of choice available and at different, so you might need to have subsequent lines as well, but do you think, and perhaps Nick is a person to start um, off this question, but did you, how did you kind of think about choosing what your next treatment was with kind of keeping your next, next treatment in mind as well? And is, is that, um, is that a challenge? Is that an issue about to consider? Obviously, we, you have that kind of first line, but for every subsequent line of, of uh, treatment that you have, is, is choosing that treatment, are you thinking about the next one after that that you might need? Does that influence your choice? <coughs> yeah, I think most definitely. Um, but I think the reality that the moment I needed treatment, my treatments all of a sudden narrowed down. And, and, and um, I consequently maybe didn't have as much choice as I thought I was. Um, but without a doubt, I, I was very mindful about next treatment. And, you know, that was why the decision was made at the time with me that maybe go down the road of ibrutinib, that in itself it could manage the disease and help me move to that next step that should I not tolerate it and should uh, I fail on it, that I would then be in a position to try something that I wasn't able to tolerate at the time because of the disease, yeah? So I had options that I saw there, and, and at the time I knew about, you know, as a, as a, as a as a potential option. And um, at the moment of my treatment choice, the venetoclax wasn't an option because I was my marrow was so heavily impacted and I also had, had issues. Um, but yeah, you're very mindful of it. Um, it's not just when you start the treatment, it's also whilst you're on the treatment. I'm sure many of us are joining us at the moment are on a treatment and you're mindful now of what's coming next. So, you know, it's quite exciting from a point of view now to see opportunities open up, you know, with the Loxo drug coming into trial as a non-covalent, that means there's another BTK opportunity there. And um, now I'm responding and doing quite well, touch wood, on the abrutinib. On, on, on uh, um, those options that I wanted in the first place may still open to me. So, so yeah, I think without a doubt, I think talking to your doctors, listening to doctors that talk to me, 
Um, everybody is trying to be mindful about where you go next, but you can't obsess about it. I mean, in the old days, and I'm sorry to hog time, but in the old days, it was literally the disease is what it is. This is the treatment that's available. Don't think too far ahead because the landscape's changing so fast that what might be available then will be different to what's available now. And it's still proving true now. So I wouldn't obsess too far into the future. Live for the moment. Just make sure that you're doing the best you can at that moment. Yeah, I think, as you said, it is. It's, it seems to be a very exciting time within haematology, let alone within CLO as well. And Tal's diagram of the kind of over the, the decades since 1970, how it's all kind of come compact compressed to lots of things happening in the last kind of 10 years as a absolutely a but i think you've raised you know there's the change mm. you can actually stop now and think a little bit further ahead mm. maybe the generation when i was diagnosed you couldn't um and 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 you know so it's webinars like this that are invaluable to everybody so a, a, a bit of depth of knowledge and have that discussion with your doctors. Ask them what they think. What do they think? Where do they think you're going to would have to go next? Should you have to go next? It's a question you can ask. Yeah. And so on that kind of we touched on about preparing for treatment, but kind of when you're on treatment or considering how the treatment is kind of delivered. But Leanne, do you do you have discussions with patients about us some of those treatments? You know, we, I think Tal touched on it about things like the quality of life for an individual, but some of those can be what well, will need more trips to the hospital to have on, and some might not need as many or could be delivered in the community as well as that. How do you kind of address that kind of shared decision making approach with with patients where there's so potentially so much choice? How do they kind of actually make a choice around that that they're kind of comfortable with and feel informed about? So I think that's one of the key roles of my job, really, is after the clinic discussion, allowing to either arranging to do a follow up call with people and discuss through how the treatment's delivered. Or some people won't leave where the ball's in their course and they call me once they've had time to process the information. I find during the clinic discussions, there's quite a lot of information to take on board, in particular, mm -hmm. if more than one treatment's being discussed. And then if potentially there's a clinical trial in the mix as well. Um, so I do tend to touch base. I mean, we, yes, like you were saying earlier on, we have emails, but sometimes it, which, you know, can be really valuable. But when there's quite a lot of information going on um, with treatment pathways, sometimes I find it easier to do it via phone. And we do talk through the options. If it's, say, for example, if you have a calibrutinib or abrutinib, this is how the drug's delivered. If you go down the venetoclax route, um, then this is how it's delivered. And then obviously it depends if there's a monoclonal antibody in the mix as well, if there's ofatumab or rituximab, how long the duration of treatment would last for. And practically on a on a day day to day living, you know, what are we looking out for for side effects? How are those side effects managed? How, how will it impact on what they can do? Like, you know, obviously it's been different because of COVID, but if COVID wasn't in the mix, does it impact on how they're living day to day? And I actually think Nick, your points that you were making just now were really interesting for me to hear from a nurse perspective about thinking about the next line of treatment because it's not a question that I personally get asked that often. Um, about the next line of treatment, it's normally something that's discussed mainly when people are diagnosed. People often ask what the treatment options are, but it's not that frequent that I get asked about the next line of treatment, um, particularly when commencing treatments. So that was really interesting to hear from your viewpoint. So thank you. Pleasure. Thanks. Um, so again, with that in mind, a couple of questions about options again. So someone specifically asked about the TP53 or 17P deletion mutation, does that make a difference for patients in their second or third line treatment options? Perhaps back to Tal, you may have covered this. Um, yes, I think, I think in terms of, um, uh, it does make a difference in terms of how I would see the disease now. So say for example, if the patient already had TP53 deletion or mutation in the frontline setting. And in that case, my personal opinion is that prolonged therapy is most probably useful. Um, and I choose BTKI inhibitor um, at that point. And then when you have the second line therapy, I might not have too much interest in P53 
TP53, but I want to look at the whole genome now, whether there's complex karyotype developing, which is multiple other genetic abnormalities evolving. And I will do a molecular panel to look at all of that. And I will look at the FISH result, which is another test we do in the laboratory to tell me how complex the disease is becoming now. And then I actually look at the drug specific mutations now. So I look at the BTK 16481 mutation, whether the patient has acquired that, whether our patient has become resistant to Winataclax because of some BCL2 uh, mutation. So I, I think the problem is that with these drugs come other kind of genomic complexity, which we haven't seen before. And we are understanding that more at this moment in time. So when we're talking about just t looking at TP53, we're just looking one part of the equation. You have to look at the overall picture. If there is complex karyotype developing, I would like to offer a clinical trial to that patient because I, I, can, I can see that, that actually that might be the beneficiary. The patient might be able to uh, benefit from that combination of treatment that is available on the clinical trial which might not become available on NHS for another four or five years. So this is how I talk to the patients about clinical trials and see what is the benefit of going on to the trial. And then I say, these are the other options, which are equally very good option. With the yeah. clinical trial, this is the benefit, but there is a bit of uh, unknown there as well, which we need to know in the clinical trial as well. Um, so I, in my the short answer is yes, I would look at, TP53, but look at the whole genome at that point. I think as Charlotte's pointed out in the chat as well, we did cover this in more detail about the particular testings in the first line treatment where it's more clear cut um, and, and more uh, uh, has, has more of an impact. Um, just cover, cur quickly covering around that kind of access to treatment. Now you've mentioned clinical trials quite a lot and you know, all, of those all of those treatments that are available on the NHS, are they available in all hospitals and in all of the UK countries? Um, and then if, if not, are people able to kind of try to kind of get second opinions or, or try to kind of access some of that treatment elsewhere and travel in more detail. I guess there's a difference between what's already been approved to be available on the NHS through a health technology assessment versus the ones that are only available through clinical trials. And, and Tal, you're very clear about what, you know, having that discussion, um, uh, perhaps not everyone's got a, a Tal near them uh, uh, that they could have that same kind of discussion with. So how would you, how would you advise other people to, to kind of ensure that they're getting access to the right treatments that they need or perhaps they would like to have? Um, and then Leanne, you've got a different experience from a different center, so perhaps. So I, th I think it's, it's important that um, the, uh, all the cases like this are discussed in a, in a multidisciplinary team meeting. And um, we have a lot of uh, neighboring district general hospitals where um, my colleagues who are very good clinicians, but they might not have that much expertise in CLL and they will bring the cases to our MDT. And we, we have a very good discussion about which is the right treatment for our patient. And, what I do tell um, the, them is that, you know, I've got this trial to offer this patient, um, but it's up to them to make a choice and have a discussion because the patients trust their clinicians. And essentially that is the, the trust is the most important factor in getting a patient through the whole journey of CLL treatment. So if, if for example, Nick doesn't trust me, then he's not going to come to me to have treatment for that. I think that's the most, that's the basics of that. And I think if the trust is there, then I can offer you, you know, my opinion and I can listen to you what your opinion is as well. And we can go hand in hand and, you know, take you through the journey as, as much as we can. And I think the, uh, in terms of the equity, I think the drugs are available in Scotland. I it was available throughout the COVID pandemic where, uh, you know, um, FCR, uh, we were not able to use it in England, but um, I think it is available everywhere. I think when it comes down to the relapsed refractory setting, you need to look around. I think in terms of the clinicians, um, they need to look at options, which is available to their closest hospital. The trials in the relapsed refractory settings are drying up a little bit at the moment because everything is moving 
into the frontline space, but um, we still want to offer the you know whatever is available out there to our patients. And um, you know if you you know if there is a something um, you know where there's no, nothing up the no option there uh, for you, then simply you know you can give give a, you know ask your clinician to contact us or you can contact us directly it's not a problem at all um, but majority of the colleagues actually in the country will look at their local referring center and will ask for an option and most of the trials will be open but there are very few phase one studies which would be open in very few centers like the LOXA studies open in Oxford, Plymouth and Leeds so it is very uh, very very selective so it is a matter of looking around as well, I must say. Yeah. Yeah, and just, just Leanne, if you've got any comments on that, just before that, I was, you know, we had quite a lot of discussion in last time about seeking second opinions. And again, that's not necessarily about whether you about trust or not. It's just kind of satisfying yourself that you're you're as a patient as as getting in and getting uh, all the information that you you can. And that was kind of encouraged. By, by that is that is that fair to say Leanne and yeah I mean if, if people want second opinions then I think that's a completely reasonable request and to be yeah. referred and to do that and, and you know I don't think there's any, any issues with doing that at all um, I agree with everything that Tal said actually I mean we do the same we have the MDT meetings um, I don't know if everyone knows what an MDT meeting is but um, it's when the whole team come together so there's radiologists uh, radiotherapists consultants there nurses there and the case will be presented, they'll look at the most common blood results, what the most common op, um, issues are that the patient's experiencing. And they'll also have a look at the most up-to-date CT scans. And then a team of people will discuss what they feel would be the most um, the best treatment to go forward with. And of course, those discussions would then be had with the patient and you know those decisions made together. Um, and that's and that's standard practice that people would be discussed at the MDT before um, going ahead with treatment. And like Tal said, also clinical trials would also be mentioned at that point as well. Thank you. Charlotte. Great, thank you. Um, we're approaching the end. So I thought my last question may be about COVID, as we've not mentioned it very much at all during the webinar. Um, maybe back to you, Leanne, in terms of how COVID has impacted on specifically those you are trying to treat during the pandemic. Has it, has it been a challenge for you? Um, I think we're all working very differently. Um, I think clinics, um, we're still very busy. I mean, there's still people that need to be seen, but obviously the hospital is looking different than how it used to look. Um, so we're seeing people face to face still if they want to be seen face to face we're never going to turn anyone away if anyone's got any concerns then we're seeing them face to face or if we feel it'd be more beneficial to see people face to face then we're um, absolutely doing that and we're also seeing a biggest bulk of people we're still reviewing um, over the phone as well yeah great thank you and um, Tal has it changed the treatments you've decided to offer all those factors you were talking about right at the beginning um, in terms of sort of balancing pros and cons that Nick and, and Robin have discussed it has that all changed as well um, yeah definitely when we were at the height of pandemic I was you know majority of the patients I was seeing um, uh, as a telephonic consult or um, through the um, various apps that NHS allows us to use um, and um, definitely had an impact. I wasn't using uh, chemoimmunotherapy anyway to, for our patients and um, giving venetoclax was very difficult. I must be honest, you know, getting patients in um, every week for five weeks um, for multiple blood tests. And in our center, we treat everybody as an outpatient. So still then there was a substantial risk. So I've delayed a lot of treatment for some patients uh, because CLL is one of those diseases where we have got some time, but uh, patients who need a treatment, yes, acalabrutinib on expanded access program, we were able to utilize that quite well. Um, I think it's just uh, now we are opening up again and we are offering all the treatments of my kind of um, diagram making more sense now, whereas it wasn't last year because I was just choosing what was right at that point, which was stay as COVID safe as possible, uh, whilst giving the best treatment possible that we can give to our patients.
saw that has frozen out of it, I think. I believe Charlotte has frozen. Um, she may come back with us if she's dropped out for the moment. I think she may have dropped out. I think Charlotte was going to come to um, myself. Oh, Charlotte's back. Okay. I'm here. Sorry, everybody. So I was just coming <laughs> yeah. back to your last question you were about to field. Um, I was going to pick it up, but I'll let you ask it because I never told anyone what it was going to be. <laughs> you might need to. I think, I think Charlotte's frozen again. Well, Charlotte was going to uh, ask me about top tips before. Um, uh, well, my I, last question, but thank you, Tal. I did catch most of what you said. Yeah. Um, so my top tip um, as patient um, approach and treatment was communication channels. And let's not forget maybe the groups that haven't been talked about as much is the charities and the resources that are available to support you alongside uh, your care team. Um, Counselling, for example, if you can access it or talking to others at charities um, and peer support. Yeah, it's online support groups, support groups and other facilities offered by charities. I, I think there you've got silent friends when you can't often get what you need from your, your, your friends and family. And especially in COVID times, our communication channels are a lot better and the charities are really geared up for helping us. That would be my top tip. Don't isolate yourself and make use of the resources that are available to you. Thank you, Nick. I caught all of that in the end um apologies everyone i'm back now i think it's telling us to wrap up and move on to get on get on with the rest of the day so, so robin is there anything you wanted to add as as the last um, i think i'd make one comment related to the era we're in at the moment which is to try to get out in the fresh air as much as possible while safely <laughs> and um, try to make sure you keep that quality of life up as high as you can within reason that's probably about it other than that nick's covered it all i think <laughs> charlotte's frozen oh no great thank you i can hear you but you probably cannot see me um, but we'll give the we'll give ending the webinar a go and see how it goes. Um, could we have the finishing slides, please? Just while we're waiting for those, um, just want to say thank you to everyone, um, for all of our speakers today. You've, you've been fantastic. Um, we've covered a lot of topics all in one go. Um, and I think we've answered everybody's questions. Anybody who hasn't had their question answered, um, please do get in touch with us. You'll get an email from us afterwards, which you can just reply to for further questions. Um, just to briefly cover our services um, available from both charities, um, a range of information sources, and I'm sure we'll plan a, a webinar again very, very soon. We've got... Um, The next one we're doing is next month, um, specifically on clinical trials, although not simply trying a clinical yeah. Nick, do you want to carry on? <laughs> next one is clinical trials. Oh, it's unfortunate. <laughs> it seems we're being timed out. Um, yeah, I'm just thanking everybody. I think... Um, my computer is also frozen now with slides. Um, I think maybe we've got a little bit of a problem at the moment, Zoom. So I'd just like to thank all of the panel for joining us and uh, giving the time today. And thank you for the audience. And it's encouraging to see so many of you have stayed with us. Thank you for all of your questions. Charlotte, are you able to say anything? <laughs> so thank you from us. That's it. Uh, Thank you from us and uh, goodbye, everybody. I think Charlotte may be able to end things from her end. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.